The dream of the stars was always strong within us. From our earliest days of sentience, we gazed upwards and dreamed of the day we could walk among the points of light that glittered so attractively in our heavens. As we grew and learned more of the world we inhabited, the dream was always with us. Slowly, we pulled ourselves through the ages, first stone, then bronze, iron and steel. We created commerce and it became our proxy for warfare, and though we did not realise at the time, we had passed our first brush with the great filter. Trade, not war, became our way of life. Our ships sailed the oceans during an age of discovery. Then we took to the skies, climbing ever closer to the dream of stars. Then came the nuclear age, our second brush with the great filter. But our leaders saw this and recognised it for what it was, guiding our races, different factions in peace and trade, without obliterating ourselves with nuclear fire. We developed faster and faster with each passing year, soon launching satellites and then ourselves into orbit, then to our moon. Eventually, we explored our entire solar system. The day came when our scientists announced the first Ethiop drive capable of reaching the nearest star. In our excitement, we watched as the bravest of us breached that final gulf and gazed in wonder at the light from a different star up close. For a brief time, we celebrated and congratulated ourselves and the age of colonization began. Our focus was inward towards the centre of the galactic arm we inhabited, and in this direction we strove, colony after colony established, until we numbered over 20 worlds as our own. Then first contact happened. The Federation of Worlds discovered our latest colony and communication was established. They gave us communicator tech so we could talk and trade, but we didn't notice we had just failed the Great Filters test. We repulsed them. Our bodies something of horror to their collective psyche. In trade we found them to be more and more dishonest in their dealings with us. They grew indifferent, then hostile towards us. Pirates flooded our systems, raided our ships and stole everything they could. The Federation then sued us through their course for non-delivery, and we were made to pay and pay and pay again. Eventually, open hostilities broke out. Federation fleets assaulted our worlds, enslaving our people or just murdering them outright as they took what was ours. We tried to fight, but against the Federation it was hopeless. For them it became a sport, a free-for-all, where we were the prey and they the hunters. Colony after colony fell until that final day... Our homeworld under siege, as whatever transports we can muster, fled into the darkness, away from the galactic arm, into the space between. I know not what happened to our home. I like to think our warriors held the line long enough for our evacuations to complete, but the truth is none of us know how the end came. Our homeworld simply went silent, and we fled onwards into the void. I was one of the lucky to escape aboard the transport ship, Eclipse, frozen in stasis with my mate and hatchlings, and the others when the fire broke out. The ship woke me and others of the engineering crew to deal with the emergency, and through the pain and disorientation of the rapid defreeze, we managed to extinguish the flames, but our ship would not travel much farther. We awoke our command staff, and they decided to set down on the nearest habitable world we could find. A hellish place, of rock and sand and burning wind. Our first task was to hide and disguise the ship, so we buried it deep into the rock, covering it in stealth webs. We knew our power core could be detected from orbit, so we built geothermal systems for power, we removed the core, splitting it up and burying its pieces as far away from our ship come shelter as we could, trying to make the radioactives look like natural formations. We managed to create some small farms, but not nearly enough to feed everyone, so we took it in turns to wake and watch over our sleeping brethren. We knew we were doomed, but we refused to give up. During my fifth waking watch, the monsters arrived at our world. Panicked, we hid, shutting everything down to avoid detection. Again we woke our leaders, and they decided we should watch these interlopers carefully, and seek to find weakness we could exploit, if they ever found us. We saw their ship land and watch as they built their own colony, or plexiglass domes. They were unfamiliar to us, but we didn't know every race of the Federation, so that was not unexpected. Tall and straightly graceful as they moved about. We could see they had different castes, farmers, warriors, and at times were accompanied by another species that walked on all fours. We learned to fear these quadrupeds. They could sniff you out from hundreds of metres away, so we hid deeper in the rock. Only coming to the surface at night to watch them, under the baleful stars that once held such wonder. Then came the day of second contact. One of their hatchlings, a child, broke through the roof of one of our older tunnels and fell 15 metres to the floor, badly injuring itself. I found it by accident as I travelled to our geothermal shafts for the day's work. The poor creature was delirious with dehydration and pain, the inner skeleton of one of his legs broken and protruding from the skin. I was beside myself not knowing what to do. I called for help for my brethren, and as I waited, I cautiously approached the stricken being. 
I remembered looking at me with those blue eyes, and what could only be fear etched over his features. It tried to draw away from me and screamed in pain from his broken limb. I could see his terror, and in me it tugged at that part of me that was a father to my own children. I felt pity as well as my own fear. The being stopped, tried to escape, and lifted his other limbs, clearly ready to try to defend itself from my advance. His eyes grew even rounder in shock when I extracted a water carrier from my belt and offered it. For a few moments his gaze went from me to the water, and back again, then he reached out a shaky limb and took the offered drink. It struggled with the fastener for a few moments, until I very slowly and gently reached forward and unclasped the lid. It looked at me briefly in what I think was thanks, then drank the entire container's worth of water. Though still weary, it allowed me to examine his injury. Using my pedipalps, I tapped my fangs and made small biting motions to the wound, without touching, as it watched my actions with wide eyes. It seemed to grasp my intent and nodded once before turning away. I bit as gently as I could, injecting non-killing vellum into the flesh in what I hoped was enough to anesthetize the wound. Though it flinched at the nip, I heard his breath quieten with relief as the venom mercifully took effect, numbing the pain. It turned to look at me again and made a sound that I hoped was thanks, just as my brothers and sisters arrived in response to my call for help earlier. I turned to face them in the tunnel, flowing my forelegs wide in defensive stance to prevent their approach any closer lest they scare the being senseless with their numbers. One of our leaders soon arrived and surveyed the scene, questioning me of my actions and thoughts as it shooed the others back. The leader thought for some time, then simply decided in the pragmatic and ordered us to carefully transport the beam back to our buried ship for any medical care we could offer. Before we moved it, I approached again, and as carefully as I could, wrapped the wound in silk to prevent further injury as we carried the beam. By now it didn't seem afraid at all, and allowed us, even assisted us in its relocation. By the time we arrived at our infirmary, it seemed to be almost comfortable in our company. Our medic was able to reset the bone in his limb, and fashion a cast in silk to protect the limb, and provide traction to the bone to assist its healing. Though we did not know if the limb would heal or simply fall off as our own do, when injured to such a degree. Once our medical tech finished her immediate task, she set about weaving a hammock of sorts for the creature to rest on. It took only minutes, and between me, the tech, and our leader, we carefully lifted it onto the bed, where it probably closed its eyes and became unresponsive. There was alarm at this, initially, until the medtech assured us that she believed the being was in an unconscious state, similar to other Federation species we knew of, and this was very likely a healing response, a motion that we should leave and allow her to monitor the creature as it rested. As we left, the leader motioned me to follow, and we went to his quarters. Inside, he served me refreshments with his own hand, and we talked. He told me that the next steps would probably decide if we all lived or died, so it was crucial that we considered carefully and made the right choices. I was in complete shock. This leader was addressing me as an almost equal, and in my elation I agreed to anything said, though I did come to regret some things. Overall, I'm glad I did. So the next morning, I returned to the infirmary and was delighted to see the alien was active and appeared to be doing well. This was confirmed by the medtech, who told me to look at what the creature had done, she showed me a pad with a shaky hand-drawn picture of myself standing over the helpless creature, my legs raised in defensive posture facing my kindred, clearly protecting it. This was just what I needed. I took the picture and headed to the outside world. Our leader met me at the exit and wished me the best of luck in our agreed plan as I headed out towards the alien camp. Circling around it, keeping out of sight until I could see the guarded gate with two of their warriors pacing to and fro, I mustered up all the courage I had and lifted the picture up high and waved it around to attract their attention. In a few seconds I heard a shout, then an alarm as more warriors flooded out of the gate, accompanied by those vicious quadrupeds. But the stars I was so scared. Pressing myself into the ground as hard as I was able, adopting the most submissive posture I could, I kept the picture up as high as I could and waited, but not for long. They quickly surrounded me with the quadrupeds, making a terrifying noise as the tall aliens held them back with leashes around their necks. I raised my eye clusters up ever so slightly to see one of the giants cautiously approach, and I extended the picture towards it, praying to every god I could think of, so I would not become a victim of the lethal-looking weapon it carried. Keeping a wary eye on me the whole time, it reached out and took the offered picture, and looked at what he held. Saying something to the others, the picture was quickly handled around, and they, while still cautious, seemed to relax just a little bit. The one who approached first then retrieved the picture from his comrades, and folding his legs up, crashed down much lower, closer to my level. With a single digit, it pointed at the image of the creature in our med bay, then made a show of looking around as if it didn't know where to look. I understood, and using the same leg I waved the picture around with, pointed at the way I had come. It raised itself up to its full height, 
and stared in the direction indicated before shouting commands to the others. Most moved back to the gate, but three others, two of whom led quadrupeds, screwed with the one who spoke, and he seemed to gesture that I should lead. So that's what I did, stopping every twenty paces or so to ensure they still followed. I led them back to our home. When the entrance came into view, I saw our leader patiently waiting, who upon seeing what followed me stepped to one side and pointed his own long leg at the tunnel entrance. The creatures behind me stopped. They obviously discussed what to do next, and the one who led them finally stepped forward, while the others took defensive positions, waiting. And their leader approached us and gestured to the picture he carried, again making the looking around act in front of the tunnel. Our leader turned slowly and gestured it to follow as he led the way inside with me following along behind the giant as it too entered. As we made our way into the darkness, the giant activated a sharp bright light mounted on his weapon and illuminated our way as we approached the very ship. I heard it making sounds seemingly to itself until I realised it was talking using a device to its comrades outside. As we entered the ship, it cleaned notice and ran its digits along the wall, before thumping hard to produce a metallic ring. But it didn't stop, not until we entered the infirmary. The smaller injured creature, who I later found out was a young female, was sitting facing the medtech in a hammock. They were both singing an alien song and periodically clapping their hands, or pedipals, together. I was dumbstruck, and looking up at the giant, so was he. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, the little one sang, along with, incredibly, the medtech. Though in truth, the croaking coming from the medtech didn't sound anywhere near as melodic as her vocal cords struggled around the words. The giant beside me made a sound, and the little one squealed happily as she turned to see us. Uncle Barry! She held up both limbs, and the giant moved forward and scooped her up into his own. God, Casey, we were so worried. Are you alright? The whole damn colony is out searching for you, the giant said. He listened to her reply and set her down again, Jenny paying close attention to her wounded limb. Then he spoke through his device to the others outside. Harris, get back to the base and get a transport. I found Casey. She is okay except for a broken leg. I think these spiders have been looking after her. He helped the little one to him again. Then added, Harris, bring my brother and Mel with you when you come back. Oh, and the biologist Hodgkins. I think we found a job for him after all. Things moved quickly after that. Their biologist was all too happy to wear our communications tech we gave to them. And in the space of a few hours, we could at last communicate. We discovered these humans were not part of the Federation. Indeed, they had never encountered them at all. They asked us about our own race, and our leader told them everything. At some point, the biologist was joined by a human female, who quietly listened as we recounted how we had been treated at the Federation's hands. When we told them of the attacks upon us, we could see the anger in their eyes. When we told them of our race's enslavement and slaughter, they were visibly upset, and their eyes leaked fluid as they listened in some silence. Finally, the female said, and even though you didn't know if we were of this federation you spoke of, you still saved my daughter? She paused. Damn you guys have kahunas. Seal kahunas. And then she wrapped her arms around me and hugged me to her. Thank you, she whispered. Then they told us the ways of the federation were not their ways, and they offered us their hands in friendship. The same day, transports from their colony arrived with more food than I had seen since fleeing our homeworld. They cleared out one of their huge plexiglass domes and offered it to us as a new home in their colony. An offer we gratefully accepted. Days later, a starship arrived. It carried diplomats from their homeworld, and our leaders talked for hours. Their diplomats were accompanied by news seekers, the press, they called them. They took pictures of us, our ship, and most importantly of all, the rescued little girl and the picture she had drawn of the brave spider defending her from my kin. Of course, we all knew I was not defending her, but that's how they spun it, and by God, it worked. In weeks, hundreds of their ships were in orbit, and we were not only their first contact, but we were heroes. It felt like every single one of them wanted to meet us in person. A couple of months later, the super heavy lift ship called Diligence arrived in orbit, and we were told the humans wanted to gift us a tropical moon as our new home. We were completely taken aback at their generosity. They dug our ship out from its cover, and lifted it straight into orbit with this insanely powerful ship. They sent ships to our former homeworld and colonies, Silent and stealthy ships that reported back horrors beyond imagination at the plight of what remained of my species. I won't go into detail, but humans really don't like slavery, or sentient beings used as food. They also sent exploration ships out into the void and searched for other refugee ships. We were asked to accompany them as equals, as crew, and we found many of our lost brothers and sisters. Oh, that time it was magnificent. The joy of family reunited will never leave me as long as I live. These humans, they helped us regain our dignity. Before we could really even comprehend what was happening, we found ourselves at the forefront of a human crusade against the Federation. After all, 
The humans understood that, if it had not been for our meeting and our warning, they could well have ended up as we had if the Federation had encountered them first. As it was, the Federation didn't stand a chance. First, the humans placed ships in every Federation system. They listened and watched and drew up their plans to bring the Federation to its knees. It took years, but as we discovered, the humans make very good plans. Of course, we could not allow them to bear this burden alone, and our newly awoken warriors demanded to assist the humans and were greatly welcomed. Each human regiment wanted one of our warriors in their number, and any regiment that got one immediately changed its name to something that reflected that fact. Black Widows was a popular name, as was Tarantula and Wolf Spider. When the day came, it was glorious. Almost half a million human warships descended on the Federation, in all their systems, all at once. They destroyed most of the Federation military on the ground, or still docked in their orbitals. When the Federation Council surrendered unconditionally, and pled for mercy, the humans forced them to return all my enslaved species, and pay massive restitutions to us, as well as pay for the entire human war effort. They forced them to rebuild our homeworld and colonies, not once giving an inch in their demands. So now, there is a new federation. A human-led federation where the rule of law is enforced and species really can live together in a semblance of harmony. And we? We sit at their right-hand side. We are trusted advisors and are forever grateful that the humans gave us a second chance at passing the great filter. <laughs>